Join us as we explore a variety of school safety topics, ranging from digital citizenship to STEM and science lab safety, from bullying among students to school-wide trauma responses. Welcome everyone. Welcome back to Safer Ed. Today we'll be examining another aspect of safer schools and that is school to home communication. Now to add some dimension to this conversation today, uh, our guest is a recognized thought leader in this area who can better help us understand how to connect schools with families and improve student outcomes and school success through enabling technology and educating the community simultaneously. Big, big uh, accomplishments, but it can be done. Now, joining me today is Dr. Chad Stevens. Dr. Stevens is the Chief Strategy Officer at Parent Square where he is charged with creating, communicating, sustaining the company's strategic initiatives. In addition, he advises on all aspects of company operations and expanding Parent Square's relationships with school districts across the entire United States, supplying, in, supplying insight and driving execution. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about Chad's background because it is really, really impressive. Chad led the K-12 education vertical at Amazon Web Services and was the chief strategist at CDW and a senior K-20 consultant at Dell. Now, not only did he do that, he was a successful 14-year educator where he started as a teacher, then assistant principal, principal, director of IT, and then the chief technology officer at the school district. And today, Chad still maintains his superintendent certification in the state of Texas. Chad is a current member of the COSIN Board of Directors and the board chair of the Indian Prairie Educational Foundation. He was recently named one of the top 100 influencers in EdTech by EdTech Digest. And he has spoken and written extensively over the past decade on the, here's the word, intelligent use and adoption of technology in schools. He has a Bachelor of Science from Tarleton State University, a Master of Science in Educational Management from the University of Houston, Clear Lake, and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Educational Administration from Texas A&M College Station, Texas. Welcome to Safer Ed, Dr. Stevens. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. I am delighted. I'm tickled pink that you're here and you could spend some time and join us today. Our global audience has many questions surrounding the safety and security of schools. And I think that you're just an absolute wonderful individual to shed some light on this important aspect of education. Now let's start off a little bit today by talking a little bit about what communication looks like in today's, I'll, I dare say, traditional school environment. Yeah, I mean, you know, Communication in today's school environment is really complex, right? I, mean, I think you you said air quotes tra traditional. I'm, I don't know if there is a, a traditional <laughs> environment, right? So you have, you know, you have parents that, um, you know, a traditionally may, you know, have been going to work and now they're working from home. You have kids that, you know, are going to school um, remotely. You have kids that are in, in, in physical school. There, there's just, there's just a lot of things. And right. so when we think about it, um, you know, parents in a lot of ways are like, in some ways don't have a lot of information, but often, and also may often feel inundated with information. And so, you know, right. trying to figure the, the, the happy medium between those two is, is really tough. So as a, as a parent myself and as a, a, an educator, I can say safely that communication from school to home was largely one way. And 100%. there was a whole lot, there was a whole lot of hope involved that if you sent something <laughs> home with students, you hoped that it would get there. And as a parent, you hoped that your student, your, your, your children would give you whatever the school put in their backpacks or sent home with you. Is that, is that a fair statement? That's, yeah, it's very fair. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things we talked about a little bit before the, the show was, you know, what are some common challenges? And, you know, I think about things like, you know, actually measuring what you're doing. Um, you know, I think, you know, oftentimes you'll hear a, a, a school say, our, our families are really engaged. 
in fact they're too they're maybe they're too engaged if that's a, such a thing like you know are, they're, they're right you hear that like almost in a sarcastic kind of way and I would and I would always I tend to challenge that now that I've been in the family engagement world kind of shifting into this world to go well how do you know like how do you know they're engaged um do right. you have metrics around the gauge do you have metrics around how many app notifications they're opening do you have metrics about what phone calls they're picking up and more importantly do you know who's not engaged um right. and i think um we we tend to for many many years when when it was one way we sent out messages and, and said, well, we sent out X amount of thousand messages. So they're sent, we're good. And now we're in a world where, you know, the way people engage with that content um, in all walks of life outside of education is, is well measured, right? You can tell that, you know, the Absolutely. way you interact with marketing and things like that. And it need and and we're really pushing um, the envelope on making sure that happens in school so that every everybody has a voice and we can actually find the pockets of people that aren't engaged, you know, for a couple reasons. One, because you know every everybody should have a voice, but two, that voice um, could could enrich the district, right? So, like, if you have this other group that's not involved. Like what are what are we missing from a equity lens and from an engagement lens that makes the school a more, you know, getting to the point of of what you do on this this broadcast is really a trusted, safe place where everybody feels welcome and and can kind of speak right. open and, and feel good about it. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on there. So if I unpack that a little bit, how would having a unified means of communication? help a district either save money or or on those reporting analytics that you talked about how beneficial is that to a school well, district i mean i think I, I, I mean there's definitely there's a cost right i mean there's a there, there's a cost but I, I think it goes beyond that so you know there's really like if you if you go out online and, and start to research like the term family engagement or you know there, well, there's 50 years of research from some of the, you know, Columbia, Harvard, you name all the universities that say um, when, you know, when, when families are engaged, when parents are engaged, they do, kids do better in school. They go to school. They have better attendance. Right. Right. Um, they have better mental health. Like, the, I mean, the, the research is really littered with, with that example. But, you know, you think about you know, I asked somebody the other day, how much money have we spent on family engagement in schools and really being good at it versus testing? Like, it's, it's not even close, right? But there's all this research that says really engaged families, kids do better in school, but we really don't have ways to measure it. On the, on the flip side, yeah, I mean, when you, you know, we have, we have schools and you don't talk too much about parents square, but like a, a couple of examples, like we have a large, you know, Cherokee County school district in Georgia, um, you know, moved everything into parent square. They start to send things out, um, in a streamlined time away, something as simple as delivering your code of conduct, delivering your student handbook right. um, digitally and knowing that you sent it out and that you can confirm that everybody's got it. And it wasn't just a, a send right. out. They've saved over $100,000 a year, $130,000 a year, hard costs of just um, not having to print those out. And right. I know people bought them. And so, you know, I think that's that's really cool. But to me, the 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 bigger piece is um, that, that idea that our tool is getting more kids in school, making people more comfortable about coming to school, developing trust, like, it's almost like there is a there is a dollar sign there somewhere, right? Because average weighted daily attendance and all that stuff, but it's it's bigger than that. And so, of course, when you take a bunch of disparate things and you put it into one, you're only paying for one thing, which is nice. Right. But, um, I think it's bigger than that because it's also about the parent experience uh, that the parents having, which increases their engagement and their trust. Um, right. Makes make, makes people feel safe. So it's hard to put. And I think that I think that's the profound key right there is that comfortableness, that safety that comes along with having an open communication 
forum or, or a highway, however you want to want to frame that. Exactly. That's uh, that is powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Doctor Stevens. Yeah, for sure. Now I'm I'm going to wear my my parent hat for a moment and ask a question from the parent side. Uh, I think oftentimes that many school districts are viewed as these giant giant gargantuan government bodies okay when in fact they're just actually they're made up of people like us like you and i 100 um, I, I, <laughs> I would love to hear some of your advice for some actionable communication strategies that could help to humanize your district and build ambassadors of your students and your family and of course that whole community i would yeah. really really appreciate that yeah, it's really interesting because, um, you know, you know, I came from being a principal. So before all this communication stuff, just like grounding in what I think is like best practice or or being a, a good human, maybe, you know, when I was a principal, right. I, I quickly went from principal where you're very human and, and hey, Dr. Stevens, I was an elementary principal and kids coming into the school and parents knew who I was and you know, you're really building a community when you're a principal. And I became the chief technology officer over the course right. of uh, two to three months. It happened very quickly. Um, uh, and you, and then you went into this place where wonderful people, but they sat in a cubicle, they typed on their keyboard and they did amazing things for kids, but there wasn't a lot of connectivity between, in my mind, between the kids and them. And, you know, right. and so we, we did all, so, so we did things like well, we'd bring some kids over to the tech building or we would, you know, uh, it's Easter this weekend. We tied a hundred Easter eggs there. We, we brought, you know, we did things <laughs> that got to see kids a lot. So I, I agree with you. Like most, uh, most parents, when they hear the word district, there is no face to that district. It's just, you're right. It's this giant it, and, and, and quite frankly, and in, in not you know, in today's political climate, and that's as much as far, that's the last time I'll say po political anything. It, it can <laughs> it can be it can be like a very negative thing. And so, we actually just did a webinar um, with Fresno Unified, which is a really big school district in California, and their public information officer had a quote in there. I, I listened to it um, again this morning. She said. The word district doesn't usually conjure up warm, fuzzy feelings. Rather, the opposite. <laughs> a in a divisive time, being seen as a faceless, nameless bureaucracy makes our school districts an easy focus for community frustration. So I was like, wow. Very well framed. That's, a, that's impressive. <laughs> so I was like, so that, that's one thing. And so I think we're going to be doing some more work on this. Right. But so a couple of tips that they had that I thought were really interesting is um, every single communication that you send out needs to have faces and names. So okay. you, don't, you don't send out an inf a, a communication that says, well, this is from the public information office, or this is from the office of the superintendent. Nobody knows who that is. The superintendent, um, he or she is a real person with That's a real right. Who might may or may not have kids that has you know that has a story, and so the more faces and names that you put into the communication, it helps and lends itself to building trust and relationships and really like personalizing things. And so, right. another thing they they really talked about, I thought was really interesting, is you know being out in the community, and so even as the public information officer, you know, going out to an event in the community and a parent going, oh, you're, 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 you're Mrs. Haley that sends us the emails. Your name was on it. Now it's a face. Right. You're a, so then you have that connection. You're also a mom or you also have a kid at that school. And if you, when you really think, of, you know, in my time at the school district, um, you know, 14 years, I mean, the school districts, the, the, those people are, they're very passionate about kids and families. That's Absolutely. The, the reason why they're there. Um, I, I had some of the most talented engineers and developers in my technology department in Clear Creek, literally that sometimes would come from NASA to work for us, you know, and the reality is, is 
they could have worked a lot of places. They're working there because of the mission, right? And so, like, right. let's get their name and their face out there. Um, they okay. even, one of the cool things they did, which I thought, I thought was super cool, is they did, uh, Fresno did a uh, magazine, a fit, like a Faces of Fresno magazine, kind of like one of these tabletop magazines that right. you would see, like, in your community. And it would be like, this is so-and-so. She leads counseling. She's, her kids play soccer and or whatever. And you think about the multi-purposes that could play in terms of helping with advertising of the local teacher credit union or your education foundation. So it's right. It's, it's limitless. It's, really. it's limitless to the way that they could use that to engage the community and make people feel together. Um, the other piece of device I'd say is, um, and I think this goes for safety too, and I can kind of go into safety a little bit is be consistent. So one of the things that, um, you know, at Parent Square that that we really believe is is there's a consistent one app, one place I go for all my information. I don't get it from Twitter and Facebook and this person down the street or this other app, right? right? And when you're consistent, um, what we find is, you know, it continues to build trust, but also you know, when there is an emergency in the school and the principal is using this tool that's also for family engagement, but then there is an emergency or there is a snow day or there is a some sort of crisis, you're using the exact same tool. So it's not like, oh gosh, where's my, where's my login to this? So I can right. log in to everybody right, right. that's bad's going on. Well, no, it's, it's the same tool you use to share great information or something that you celebrate is the same tool that you use to to to, to address some right. security issue it really i feel like it just makes people feel safer and they know it works because they're getting it every day um in a digest or whatever so i think that's a big one um, one other tip they had which i think is really good is just you know really especially in a big market like a fresno and not every school district has their own news media but you know most people have some sort of local paper, right? So build media relation, uh, build build advisories. So so that way there can be some give and take on that. So those are all some ways to, that I thought were really cool about humanizing that. And and uh, talk to our team. We're actually going to put out a, a, a little more blog around this kind of concept of humanizing your district. Which I think it's really important for for safety. So. Well, that is uh, very personal and profound, and I can see that the intent of having nameless, faceless entities start to personalize that can have huge benefits within the school ecosystem, but also, as you say, across the entire community, just expanded out all those networks. And if you think about it, you know, there was always like this, you know, again, I've lived this, right? Like I've been the principal. Absolutely. That the kid sees in the grocery store and i and I, I used to i used to joke like um i thought the kids i think like when you're in kindergarten you think that dr stevens like lives at the school right like he doesn't go to the grocery store like right I just bring like the, the the lunch ladies bring me my meatloaf every day <laughs> right? so it freaks them out but like I, I think it's a really big deal um you know and i try and i think a lot of administrators do this so this isn't really about me but like you know, I went to Little League games when I was a principal and I would go watch their football games or I would go watch them sing in the choir when they when they went to do these things. And I would try to try to be part of the community. Then when something went wrong, which it's going to, it's a school of a thousand kids, like something's right. going to go wrong. Actually, they trusted me because they knew I was a, a good person that really cared about their kids. And so I just I think. I think you can replicate that at the district level if you're using the right type of measurements and tools to, to do it. And, you know, I will just say, like, having moved from a real uh, technically focused job at Amazon Web Services, building out cloud infrastructure, which amazing group of people, um, the, the tech leaders in schools, but learning about these public information officers and communications they are like the some of them the school public relations association some of the most amazing people i've met and right and, and think about the job that they had right uh especially during the last year or two right it's just incredibly 
passionate, amazing community of people that has been the last two years really been fun to get to know. So anyway. Well, I want to touch on something you mentioned uh, in your comments there. Is there anything specific that our listeners should be, I don't want to necessarily say concerned about, but I can't think of a better word, uh, beyond FERPA and COPA and other K-12 standards in terms of security and privacy? Because everything you talked about is all about that engagement and communication, but I'm thinking that there might be some concerns yeah. or issues out there. Yeah, I mean, security and privacy are really interesting topics. Um, you know, I think they're, you know, you can't have security without privacy. You can't have privacy without security. But um, right. people use security <laughs> and privacy or privacy and security kind of synonymously. And I look at them more like a a, a yin and a yang. And so um, I think one, you know, it is the responsibility of the school district to make sure that no matter where they're sharing data, right, you're going to have to share some data to make certain tools work, um, whether that's an edtech vendor or a community partner, that that their data doesn't go beyond, right? So they have to be, they have to ask those questions and make sure that they're thinking about that. Most, you know, most folks like us, um, you know, us parents where spend a, an, an, a ton of time, you know, caring and, and really being uh, nurturers of the the right thing to do with the data but there are right. really, um there can be issues right so you know I, I would say that when you think about security you could have a very secure system as a school district but um you could also be have a secure system that within that secure system misuses data Right. Um, right. Which that means you're not really maintaining privacy. Um, and so you have to be careful. That could be as simple as a school district, you know, sending an email like they could have a lockdown system that nobody else can get into. And then a teacher sends uh, personally identified information over email to somebody. And all of a sudden, you know, it's out there. So right. I, I think um, I think there should be concerns to ask. And I think. I think it leans more into like what you ask before you buy things and an evaluation. So that that's the way I look at it. So, okay, well then, from a from a, a security or a cyber security yeah. perspective, from yes. from 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 your side of it, what questions should be asked when evaluating a technology platform for a district? Yeah. So. So a, a couple of things I think are really interesting. So like when, when I was a CTO, um, you know, I used to think about things like, um, always, there's three things, right? There's people, there's process, and there's technology. Right. Exactly. Actually, the technology is what everybody focuses on, but it's actually probably the easiest part. The people in the process part are the hardest, <laughs> right? So um, similar to what you do in your school district, um, I think you need to ask questions of, of vendors about their people and their processes, their certifications, how they handle things. What do they do if there is something that goes wrong, which is just right. as important to think about communication um, than anything else. Um, you know, you mentioned that I'm on the board of COSIN and I would, I would really, you know, we spent time as a board thinking about yeah, it's two sides, right? There's there's three corporate board members and there's there's several other school board members. Like for us as a as an ed tech, we'd rather have standardization. Because if right. you think about it, I've got, you know, um twenty two hundred school districts that are current clients or something like that, um, you know, serving over seven million kids. And if everyone wants to do this differently. That's 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 one that's a problem. And and when you think about it, now that I've been on both sides of the fence, it's really a cost thing, right? If I can if I can if I can do this in an economical way, I can keep my costs down. If I have to hire twenty security people to answer all the questions that are coming in a RFP, it makes right. the price of student go up. And I want to keep so like. I didn't think about that stuff when I was um, not responsible for running a strategy on ed tech, but I do now. So, so COSIN, um, we created the K-12 Community Vendor Assessment Tool or K-12 CVAT. And it's basically a questionnaire framework 
designed for schools districts and service districts to measure vendor risk. So basically, right. it's it's out there on the Coastal site. We could probably throw it in the sh in the show notes, but basically, it it will um, tell you exactly you know what to ask. It it, it provides some sort of standardization. And, and the, the reason was um, this exists in higher ed. And so in higher ed, there is one of these. Um, right. It's very, uh, it's very standard. And, you know, basically most of the RPs that we would see in higher ed, because they do a little higher ed stuff at, um, you know, AWS and CDW and Dell, you know, it was just like, did you meet, do you, can you check this box? So we're not there yet, but we're trying to. Uh, a lot of states, like I live in Illinois now, have some very specific laws that, um, you know, are, are going to protect, the, that are designed to protect the school district. So I just think you need to ask the question. And, uh, you know, the advice I would give would be, you know, you know, our, our team, our security team, we have a vice president of security and compliance, our CEO, um, we, myself, like, we'll get on a call and talk to, we'll talk security all day long. Um, you know, um, we've That's got, wonderful. you know, high level security professionals on our team, but we also have, um, you know, we have a parent square advisory council. We have the chairman of COSIN cybersecurity committee is on our advisory council. Um, you know, um, the, uh, the founders of the student data privacy consortium, the co-founder is on our advisory council. So we're actually asking them um, also proactively, like, like okay, great. this happened. Like, we position ourselves as very secure because we do handle a lot of information. You know, like communication is a big deal. And, yeah. uh, and to get it done right, you have to, you're working with not just the student, uh, but, you know, your parents and guardians. And, and, and we're, so we want to make sure we're doing that. So I, I would just... You know, make sure to ask, but you know, lean on lean on orgs like COSIN to to get the right information out. So, well, I think you are definitely on the right track, uh, Chad, with trying to consolidate and and bring some consistency and some cohesiveness to that entire marketplace because ultimately it only makes schools safer and more secure for everyone. So yeah. I, 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 impl I applaud you for that. That's excellent. And just, I would just add also like, you know, think about a startup ed tech. Like maybe there's a startup ed tech that has a fantastic idea, right? But okay. if they can't get past the fact that they don't understand how to be secure or know exactly <laughs> what they're going to ask, they could right. go out of business, right? And then that ends up being something that schools never get. I mean, maybe there's this really good idea. And so I think making it easier for ed techs, not easier, you're not lowering the bar, but making it easier to understand the bar, like right. what are the permissions to play in this space from a safety standpoint is a big deal because, um, you know, it's going to allow more creativity and innovation into the field, which is really what ed tech, you know, should be about, right? right. It's, it's trying to help schools, you know, so anyway. Just add that. Exactly. Now, Chad, I understand uh, I, I, this might be oversharing, but I understand that uh, you're going to be the keynote speaker at one of the best school communication conferences this June coming up in Durant, Oklahoma. Is it possible maybe you could share a little glimpse of what you'll be discussing there? Yeah, um, we're really excited. So we um, will be at GabCon um, in June. Um, Back in November, um, Parent Square acquired Gabbert Communications, and we've we didn't really talk much about that here, um, given the topic, but um, which allowed us to to um, launch Parent Square Smart Sites, which is our website product. Um, and I, I won't go too much into detail, but we're really excited about um, disrupting the website market, similar to the way we disrupted the communication market. So there's a lot of exciting things. So. Yeah, um, this is an interesting question because I've been so busy traveling <laughs> and talking to people <laughs> like you that I haven't really thought too much about what I was going to talk about um, until you asked me this question. Um, but, you know, I started a blog called the Smart Engagement Blog a few months ago, and I would imagine it'll, it'll, I'll 
probably you know it won't be like a infomercial on parent square in that gap <laughs> it'll you know i'm probably going to talk a lot about innovation um i have a point of view after 27 years doing education from like multiple angles i right. think there's something that the audience can get out of the way we think about innovation in schools you know um you know, I, I, I'll give you a sneak peek into my next blog is around artificial intelligence. Um, Wonderful. And, and I, I think, so I started to write, um, and I did some research, and every single, virtually aligned, if you, if you typed into chat GPT, why do teachers not want to use calculators in 1960? It spits out the exact <laughs> same reason why people are saying they don't want to use chat GPT in 2023. So, right. um, you know, I think I'll probably talk a little bit about that. And, you know, when I, I started teaching in 1996, so that was the year there, that, that it's really neat because uh, 1996 was the year E-rate was created. It was the year that uh, uh, President uh, Clinton was a president. He talked about the education superhighway. That was the year. In Correct. 1996, the computer to student teacher ratio in the United States was about one to 10. Um, there was essentially two computers for every classroom on average. So like I've, I, in 27 years, I've, you know, now it's, it's almost two computers or, you know, if you count a device, two devices per student, right? So exactly, yes. Or it's, it's, so I'm going to just talk, I plan on just talking about all of that and kind of like this journey from teacher in Seabrook, Texas to chief strategy officer at Parent Square to running, you know, a cloud, which, you know, which is a brand new thing. And, and I think there's some lessons in there somewhere um, around, there's probably leadership lessons, there's some innovation lessons, there's some, um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of schools, I consulted with schools. So I'm gonna try to blend all that into something that won't make people fall asleep. <laughs> um uh, it's been a it's been a while since I've done a a, a big keynote like that um because I've been I've kind of been a, a builder of businesses in my last few roles and not so much of the spokesperson that I'm doing for Parent Square. so yeah it'll be good it'll probably follow along with the the blog I've been doing because the blog's really making me think about getting back to the introduction the intelligent use of all this stuff and I think Correct. that's really what AI comes down to is um you know, there's a lot of ways that you can look like uh, I'm already I'm using it almost every day in stuff that's make that, that's making me making my job easier, you know, and, and it, it's not rocket science. Like I had chat GHP. I didn't really feel like writing my out of office. I've been out of the office for two weeks between spring break and uh, internal meetings. And I just typed in and said, chat GPT, I'm going to be da, 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 write me an out of office email. And it was beautiful. And I just copied it in. There's one less thing I had to think about because I don't have time to think about it. So I'll probably be talking about stuff like that and, and stories that I've seen. It's been a it's been a pretty, pretty amazing career the last 27 years. So but yeah. Well, I'm personally looking forward to some of those takeaways. That's uh that's always great to hear that you're forward thinking and and willing to share. Now I conducted some research on my own and and just you can feel free to stop me, but I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to give you uh, uh, two words: uh, idle hands. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that you were able to cross off something from your bucket list recently. Is is that correct? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, do you feel uh, like sharing that? It, it, I know it's a personal one, but if you want to share, <laughs> I think our listeners would love that. No, it was just a yeah. We. Uh, we were able to, we played, so the bucket list item was to, to play live in Austin. So um, we recently at COSIN had uh, our our kind of Parent Square uh, event and uh, was able to to back up uh, Jason Kyle, who's a, a singer out of Oklahoma, who, who also happens to be married to one of our employees um, there in Durant. Um, so it was, it was really fun and it, it really was, uh, to be honest, it kind of gives you a peek into some of the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say innovation. It really was right. spurred from, um, um, it was going to be pretty expensive to have Jason bring his band down and to save money and um, 
it was just easier to like pull together a uh, Jay who's our SVP of sales and myself to back him up. And we also thought it would be fun. So yeah, it was really cool. I used to, I used to play a lot in college and, and kind of had some, some pseudo, um, we had a administrator band back at Clear Creek school district, which was really fun. And so uh, it had been about a decade since I've been on stage <laughs> and, uh, it was pretty, but it was fun. It was, I think the crowd enjoyed it. And, uh, We've actually actually got asked to um, like play some other gigs from that gig, so I don't know if we will. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, I think that's remarkable. That's amazing. Yeah. Great. We're content. Yeah, some of the people there that had other conferences were like, "Could you come to our conference?" And I'm like, well, "I don't know about that." So we'll see. Um, definitely not quitting the day job. Um, if you heard any of the singing, <laughs> um, but but uh, but it was fun. So it, it's Very a good. good. So. Well, as as uh, we're coming to a close here, I'm going to ask you for your final thoughts. And here's the here's my last question for you, Dr. Stevens. If you could just magically snap your fingers wow. and make one thing happen across the educational sector, what would that be? What is your big wish? Oh, man, that's a big one. Um, you know. So I have I've always had this wish that, you know, ever since I've been a CTO or that I was a CTO, it was always frustrating to me that schools didn't have the level of technology that, 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 comp that companies and private companies did. It always seemed to me like we had it all reversed and that schools should have the greatest, the latest technology. I mean, that was really one of my impetus for going to AWS was, would this give more access and equity to the right things to build the right things for schools? And so I just, you know, I really wish that, and I think we're getting there that, that every student, all 50 million of them would be impacted by um, technology in the, in the right way and in the intelligent way to, to make them more successful. And that, and, you know, Oh, by the way, that means, 50 million different ways because every kid is an individual um, and right. technology has the power to do that, to really make it about them. And I just, ho I hope it gets there one day. I, you know, it's, you could say that's personalized learning. Um, I just think that, that there's the ability to do that and it would be amazing for equity and it would be a, amazing for all kids to, to have that. And especially with, if it was done intelligently with the with the right kind of right kind of tools, uh, you know that you would use to build things like all you know that you know if we can launch rocket ships and land them back, like why are you know why is that same level of innovation being put back into into the school system? Um, you know that that's a very good, and that that's that's expensive, but I think it would be you know pay 10, 10 X, um, invest in our kids like that. I could not agree more. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Stevens, it has been an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on safer ed today. Thank you for joining us. All of us here appreciate your time, your talent, and your ongoing contributions to school safety and security. My big takeaway today is that communication is a two-way street mm -hmm. and that the future is human-led and technology enabled so we should embrace that in the school system and do it in the safest possible way i hope i captured all of your thoughts yeah, and well said. Yeah. love it you're and you're welcome to use that if you can uh, no <laughs> trust you can have that chad <laughs> we will be <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, I look forward to further discussions. I hope you'll be able to come back and join us in the future. And until then, stay safer. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Safer Ed. We hope that the stories you have heard leave you inspired to create safer schools in your own community. If you found the content of this program helpful, we encourage you to share it with your colleagues and friends. Safer Ed is available to view at edcircuit.com and on YouTube at edcircuit. Safer Ed is also available as a podcast on your favorite podcast platform. If you have thoughts on this episode or ideas for future topics, please join the discussion on Twitter at edcircuit and reference the hashtag Safer Ed. Thank you for listening and we invite you to join us for our next episode of Safer Ed. Until next time, stay safe and have some fun doing so.
This episode has been brought to you by Science Safety. Science Safety provides a comprehensive and holistic approach to science safety risk management for schools. As a leader in science, STEAM, CTE, and lab safety, Science Safety focuses on helping organizations build a culture of continuous safety while improving lab and science classroom policies to reduce the risk of injuries and resulting lawsuits. Learn more at sciencesafety.com. Thank you.